Thank you, Dr. Alkamani. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank the course organizers for the opportunity to give this presentation. Um, it's really an honor to be here with my mentors and now colleagues to talk about uh, NASH. Okay, so we'll start out with the case presentation, and this will sound very familiar to the audience. This was a gentleman who was sent to us to liver clinic for evaluation of hepatic steatosis, which was found incidentally on an abdominal ultrasound during the workup of nonspecific abdominal pain. Um, he was a 73-year-old gentleman with many comorbidities as listed here, um, including type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, um, and class 3 obesity, that should say class 3 obesity with a BMI of 45, um, as well as complications with CAD. His past, um, or excuse me, his medication list was very much consistent with that past medical history. And um, interestingly, it included pioglitazone and semaglutide, which are both um, being considered or used for NASH, uh, semaglutide having been recently been FDA approved for weight loss. Family history was pertinent for a grandfather with hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC. He also had two uncles and a sister with uh, liver disease, which was maybe thought to be related to alcohol or not, which is a very common uh, history. The patient himself denied any alcohol use, uh, any drug use, and he was born and raised in Mexico. Physical exam, as shown here, was uh, pretty unrevealing. Uh, other than the BMI of 45, but he did not have any stigmata of chronic liver disease or decompensated cirrhosis. Laboratory data showed completely normal liver enzymes, and I'll get back to that during the rest of my presentation, but the ALT was completely normal throughout um, his evaluation and had been stable for years in the 20s. He had normal synthetic liver function tests, normal platelet count, and other etiologies for chronic liver disease were ruled out as shown here. So the abdominal ultrasound, which is really how he ended up in our clinic, showed a simple or steatosis. Uh, there were no lesions and no evidence of portal hypertension with a normal spleen and no ascites. The fibro scan was done, um, and I'll discuss some of the limitations of the fibro scan with the BMI of 45 but it showed a KPA of 10, which is consistent with stage three and four fibrosis. Um, and the CAP score was consistent with severe steatosis at 400. So because the clinical picture didn't quite make sense, um, we didn't really think this patient had advanced liver disease. The fiber scan can be great, but has limitations as we'll discuss. Uh, we ended up doing a liver biopsy, which the patient was interested in, which confirmed that he had moderate steatosis with evidence of NASH, as well as stage three to four fibrosis. So this was a great learning case for me, at least, showing that liver enzymes can be completely normal with advanced stages of fibrosis, um, and I'll show you some of that data. So when I approach a patient with NAFLD or NASH, I'd like to think of them as sort of in three or four different categories. Um, the first one is how do you actually make the diagnosis? So do you have any blood biomarkers, radiographic markers that could point you to the right diagnosis? And when do you consider liver biopsy, uh, which obviously cannot be done on all the patients? The second one, and perhaps I think that one of the most important things we can do for these patients is uh, stage the degree of fibrosis. So uh, I think every gastroenterologist and hepatologist who sees a NAFLD patient should be able to answer that question. And there's a long list of non-invasive tests that we have at our disposal which can um, help us with this question, which I'll go over. And finally, I'm lumping uh, categories three and four in the same bucket, which is treatment and monitoring. Um, it's not the focus of this presentation, but there are ongoing clinical trials looking at many uh, medications for the treatment of NASH. But as of uh, now, none of them have been FDA approved. So there are a lot of different nomenclatures for this disease. Um, and I think we all sort of use them interchangeably, but it's important to understand what they all mean. So NAFLD, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, really is the spectrum of fatty liver disease in individuals without significant alcohol consumption. And that actually can be a very hard diagnosis to make, as you know. Um, according to the ASLD guidelines, um, it's considered to be 21 standard drinks for men uh, over the span of a week. 
and 14 standard drinks for women over the span of a week. NAFL, or a non-alcoholic fatty liver, uh, simply implies that there is presence of steatosis of at least 5%, which can really be made by histology only. By the time you see steatosis on imaging, it's considered to be about 25 to 30% um, histologically. But the caveat here is that there's no evidence of liver injury, so no inflammation. Oh, excuse me. NASH, uh, which is really the focus of this presentation, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, um, again, there is presence of steatosis of at least 5%. But there is evidence of liver injury and the hallmark being um, hepatocyte ballooning uh, with or without fibrosis. So this is a different way of depicting the information. Um, this is clearly a spectrum and patients can go from one category to the next. There's a lot of reversibility in the stages of disease until they really get to the end of uh, cirrhosis and decompensated liver disease. We think, or it's estimated, that about 30 to 40% of the general population has fatty liver. Um, there's a subset of those patients, and the thought is that maybe 25% will go on to develop uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. And from there, we really um, start to worry about those patients progressing to uh, cirrhosis, including its complications of HCC um, and decompensated liver uh, disease when liver transplant is considered. What we're also learning, which is really scary, is that about 20 to 30% of all patients with NAFL without advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis can develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and the numbers are continuing to rise and we currently don't have any screening uh, guidance for these patients. So how do you make the diagnosis of NAFL D? Um, and this is really speaking from you know, a, a clinician's perspective and not necessarily from a researcher's perspective. Um, so you have to have evidence of hepatic steatosis. Most commonly it's on imaging. A lot of times it's found incidentally. Um, or if you have histology, then they have to be able to call steatosis um, and actually quantitate it on PATH. You have to rule out significant alcohol consumption. And as I mentioned earlier, the ASLD guidance recommend less than 21 uh, standard drinks for men and 14 for women. I think that's an evolving, um, really, definition because you can have coexisting NAFLD and ALD. And so how much alcohol can someone with NAFLD actually drink is really an open-ended question that we haven't fully studied. The other um, thing you have to rule out, and we'll discuss what that differential diagnosis is, is competing etiologies of hepatic steatosis. So there's actually a differential diagnosis for this other than NAFLD and alcohol. And finally, you have to rule out coexisting uh, etiologies of chronic liver disease, which, again, I think that's going to be challenged in the next years. And we see this very commonly in the post-SVR patient population, where we've cured a lot of our hep C patients. We do an ultrasound to you know, look for cirrhosis, and they have uh, evidence of steatosis, which most of the time is not driven by the viral infection. So this is a list of the secondary causes of NAFLD, which I will not uh, go through in detail, but I just want to point out that probably the most common one is alcohol-associated liver disease. Um, and as you heard in the previous talk, this is becoming probably the number one problem, uh, with NAFLD being a close second um, and how much alcohol is safe, I think there are guidance, but it still remains to be really determined. The other one I just wanted to briefly mention is drug-induced liver injury should also be on your differential. So one common example is the use of amiodarone, which a lot of these patients who have coronary artery disease, um, which come with uh, the metabolic syndrome, can be on, and that should also be considered when you see these patients with NAFLD. So really, the crux of the talk is how do you make a diagnosis of NASH? And it's really based on histology. Um, currently, there are no FDA-approved biomarkers, and there are no laboratory or imaging data that would really help you make that diagnosis. There's a lot of ongoing research to answer these questions, but if you really want to diagnose your patient with NASH, um, then liver histology remains the gold standard. So what about abnormal liver enzymes? This comes up a lot. Um, and we used to think that if you have a patient with fatty liver and you suspect fatty liver disease and you see an abnormal ALT, that the pretest probability that they have NASH um, should go much higher. 
But what we've learned, and going back to the case that I presented earlier, that's not necessarily the case. So just because you have a normal ALT in a patient does not mean that they don't have NASH, and it certainly does not mean that they, have, uh, that they don't have advanced fibrosis. So this is uh, very well il illustrated in this study. It's a little uh, bit of an older study published in 2003, but one that makes the point. And here they retrospectively looked at a group of patients, about 100 with biopsy-proven NAFLD, who had the spectrum of disease. And if you look at the y-axis, they're plotting ALT. And on the x-axis, you have the different stages of fibrosis. And all of these patients had um, features of NASH on uh, histopathology. So what they're calling an ALT that's normal is anything below 30. Anything above 30 is considered abnormal. And as you can see here, that the spectrum from zero fibrosis all the way to cirrhosis, patients had all sorts of ALT levels. Um, and surprisingly, 15 of those patients had stage three fibrosis, similarly to the case I presented earlier, and six of those patients had um, cirrhosis. So again, having a normal ALT does not rule out the disease. But can ALT actually help you in other ways? And what we're learning is that ALT can be associated with liver-related outcomes. And this was very well illustrated in a retrospective uh, large VA study where they looked at three different groups. Uh, the first group was patients with evidence of steatosis on imaging with a normal ALT, which they uh, called as anything below 40 for men and anything below 30 for women. The second group was patients with evidence of steatosis on imaging and abnormal ALT. And finally, the control group, which consisted of patients with normal ALT without evidence of steatosis on imaging. And what they did is when they looked at long-term outcomes in these patients, they found that patients with persistently elevated ALT, so again, not just one time point where they may be on a medication or have a viral infection, but persistently elevated levels, that those were actually associated with uh, liver-related complications, including the development of cirrhosis and decompensated liver disease. So I think inherently we sort of do this clinically. If we have a patient who has elevated ALT in the setting of NAFLD, I think we're much more prone to being very proactive about trying to treat their metabolic risk factors, getting them into a clinical trial, or trying vitamin E or other um, available agents. So what other biochemical findings can you see in this patient population? Um, so something that we commonly encounter is elevated ferritin and transferrin saturation uh, levels. And there's actually been a couple of studies looking at the association between these tests and liver-related complications. And what people have shown is that an elevated ferritin, as well as um, elevated transferrin saturation, are actually associated with fibrosis development as well as HCC. You know, whether this is an epiphenomenon of the disease or um, pathophysiologically, there's also a thought that perhaps there is more iron absorption in these diseases, I think remains to be determined. Um, but this is an important distinction to make because sometimes we'll see patients undergoing phlebotomy. So, you know, we had a patient once actually on the transplant service who had an elevated ferritin who was getting phlebotomized for a year before we figured out that they actually had um, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and actually needed a liver transplant and not um, weekly phlebotomy. Um, but that being said, you should still think of hemochromatosis. Right? So if you have an elevated um, percent saturation level in transferrin, you should probably obtain an HFE uh, testing for the common variants and mutations, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, the, the two can really coexist. And if the diagnosis is still not clear, then perhaps a liver biopsy should be the next step where you can actually quantitate um, iron, iron percent. So the next thing we commonly encounter is autoantibodies. Um, so these patients can have an elevated ANA and SMA, which can be nonspecific. Uh, this was illustrated in the NASH Clinical Research Network, or the CRN study, where they found that one in five patients with biopsy-proven NASH had an elevated ANA uh, and SMA, but no histological uh, findings of autoimmune disease. But as was previously discussed uh, with Dr. Hanstock, if you have a patient with elevated total IgG 
or aminotransferases that are uh, five times the upper limit of normal, then autoimmune hepatitis should really be on the differential diagnosis. And again, the two can coexist, or it, most of it can be driven by autoimmune and not NASH. And the only way you can really differentiate between the two is uh, with a liver biopsy. So as I mentioned earlier, um, perhaps one of the most important things you can do with your patients in clinic is try to stage their fibrosis accurately. And this is because um, it's been shown that NAFL patients with fibrosis are not only at increased risk of all-cause mortality, but specifically liver-related outcomes. So um, this was very well illustrated in a meta-analysis that included about 17,000 patients. Um, and if you look at the graph shown here, so the x-axis demonstrates the liver-related mortality, and the x-axis plots um, the different stages of fibrosis uh, as well as the mortality rate. And you can clearly see that starting at stage two fibrosis, that the liver-related complications exponentially increase. So there's really been a push in trying to identify the F2 patients, and trying to make sure that they're followed um, in hepatology and gastroenterology clinics. So how do you make that assessment? How do you assess the level of um, fibrosis in these patients? So there are a lot of non-invasive tests, which I've listed here for you, for your reference, which can be quickly checked in clinic. And sometimes some of these are actually embedded in the clinical note of the patient. Perhaps the most common two that we use clinically are the APRI and the FIB4 score. Um, and this is solely because they use very commonly checked laboratory data including age, AST, ALT, and the platelet count. Um, as you can see here, there are other ones, including FibroSure, FibroSpec, which are much more accurate, uh, but not necessarily readily available uh, in clinical care. Sometimes they're send out tests, so they can be more expensive. Um, sometimes the insurance companies don't really pay for them. So we sort of relied on APRI and FIB4 score. But these tests are not perfect. So just to point out the FIB4 score, which has been validated in the hep C as well as NAFL D population, um, the accuracy is quite good, but there are a lot of indeterminate cases. So FIB4 has been uh, used extensively to look at liver-related outcomes. And this is one of many studies uh, looking at uh, patients with liver cancer, so HCC, over time. And what it, it has shown, it's been validated in other uh, work, is that an elevated FIP4 score as defined by over 1.3 is more likely to be associated with HCC development. But the one caveat to the FIP4, which um, I think is important to understand, is that it can be co-founded by age. So there have been studies that show that over the age of 65, using a FIP4 is probably not very accurate because most of the number is driven by the patient's older age. So elastography um, is also very commonly used. Um, we very commonly use the fiber scan at the VA, sort of like a fifth vital sign. Um, it's very convenient. It's low risk. Um, it's readily available. It has limitations, um, similarly to the other tests that I mentioned. And perhaps the most important one is um, elevated BMI. Um, generally over 35, we tend to worry about having false um, tests. But perhaps the most accurate test is the MR elastography, uh, which is not confounded by the patient's weight uh, and BMI. So a combination of assessment um, is really the gold standard. So currently we use uh, the first non-invasive test, usually blood-based to rule out disease, with negative predictive values that are extremely high. When you're talking about ruling in advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, then we more commonly use a combination of um, usually fibroscan or the like and a non-invasive blood test. But there's a lot of times where there is discordance between the exams and a liver biopsy remains um, really the only way to, to differentiate between the two. So this is one of many algorithms that have been proposed that I wanted to quickly go over. So you have a patient who you suspect has chronic liver disease from NAFLD and you want to rule out advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. You can start with a non-invasive blood test, uh, for example, the FIP4 score. If the test is low, the negative predictive value is quite high and you can be reassured that the patient probably has a low risk of advanced fibrosis. And either they can be monitored yearly or 
Some um, guidance statements recommend repeating a fiber scan every two to three years, but that's not very clear. If the patient's non-invasive test is indeterminate or uh, points you to a high score, um, then it's nice to validate that with a, usually another non-invasive test using elastography. So if the elastography um, shows that the patient is also low risk, then I think you can be reassured that they probably don't have cirrhosis. If the patient is high risk, they should be seen and followed in hepatology clinic um, really indefinitely. And then in indeterminate cases, then again, liver biopsy remains the gold standard. But none of these really tell you any information about the liver uh, injury or active inflammation. So uh, I won't spend too much time on these, but just wanted to point out that there's a lot of work being done on combining some of these tests. So one of the more common ones is the FAST score, which combines the FibroScan and AST. And it's been specifically looked at for patients with um, histological findings of NASH and stage two fibrosis. And depending on which threshold you use to rule in the disease, you can see that the specificity and negative predictive values are quite high. There's a similar test using an MR elastography or the MAST score. Um, again, trying to identify patients with NASH and advanced fibrosis. Uh, it's a, in a much smaller patient population of only about 60 patients, um, but these are certainly coming up in the pipelines. So in summary, NAFLD is the most commonly diagnosed um, liver disease, and it's usually identified on uh, imaging or blood work, mostly by um, really diagnosis of exclusion. But do, you really rarely need a liver biopsy to make that diagnosis. ALT can be normal in all uh, stages of fibrosis and the spectrum of NAFLD and NASH. And you can not uncommonly find positive autoantibodies, ferritin, and transferrin levels. Um, and again, NASH, if you really want to make the diagnosis, really remains in a histological diagnosis. And finally, there are a lot of non-invasive tests that can be very helpful in ruling mostly out the disease, although using a combination, you can start ruling in advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. And with that, I'll stop my presentation. Thank you for your attention.